Day. In hindsight, I thought it was appropriate to perhaps introduce myself formally and explain my my worldview. Obviously, I've talked about it at length. I ramble quite a bit in this podcast. I'm sure that's costing me quite a bit of audience. I promise to make shorter, more concise episodes, especially in the coming year as I move to a new location, which will hopefully be a little more soundproof and a little more exciting to record in and actually kind of upgrade my stuff. But I digress. I am the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. I am the fictional character and exclusive client to the real-life person, R.J. Romero. I exist as a podcast talk show host personality that is embedded in a series of narrative fiction novels that surround our, you know, that, that touches on our past, our present, our future in a fictional setting. For that to make sense, you have to go and read the books, which are nowhere near complete, so there's not a lot to read yet, but slowly but surely, new chapters will be coming. Uh, As far as my worldview, I've been called by others a crazy, hippie, new age nut job, um, etc. But I wanted to share with you, in my own words, exactly where I'm coming from. I do not believe in the following, although it could be described as my belief system, I suppose. I feel strongly that I know the following to be real by virtue of experience and research. And by that I mean that the research led me to question and wonder about these sorts of ideas, and then my exploration into various meditation practices, etc., have led me to experience enough to feel certain about the following statements. I am not claiming to be enlightened. I am not claiming to be morally superior to anyone. I am not claiming anything but what I express in my own words. And I understand it, essentially, it can all be reduced down to just my opinion, quote-unquote. But I feel confident in stating that I think, or I know, that we... And I mean everybody, not just you and I listening, but everybody on the whole planet, the entire species, and beyond. By that I mean any form or vessel which life inhabits. We have always been each other. Namaste, my friends. We have always been each other. We are each other now. And I extend this to inanimate objects. I feel certain of that because it seems very clear to me from this perspective, after years of questioning and doubting and believing in other things and denying this idea until it became unbearably self-evident, that there is one unity of consciousness, one very difficult to describe, multifaceted, sophisticated, and very complex mind that is simultaneously manifesting and experiencing All that is. So that includes beyond the limits of what we know. So everything we know, and then some, is being manifest and observed by this unity, which is beyond language. We cannot describe it. Thus, given the state of affairs here on this little tiny sliver of that entirety... All-inclusive, species-wide, pineal gland-activating, third-eye-opening, transcendent enlightenment is not only that which we should be striving to achieve, because that's very terrible language that doesn't fully grasp it. It's not a thing to be achieved, so there's a sort of self-contradictory sounding-ness to it, but that's mostly due to the restrictions of language. 
this this enlightenment that I and others before me and around me now sometimes talk about is our birthright. The way, and this sounds trite and cliche, but there's a reason it's there in nature. Any creature that goes through the transformative process, and we, we tend to sort of go, ooh, ah, what a strange, weird freak of nature, but our dear friend the butterfly that, you know, spends a large portion of its life in a radically different and severely otherwise limited form. By that I mean it can't fly and do many of the things that a butterfly can. In the caterpillar form, uh, I doubt that it knows very much about what it will be after the transformation. It might very much be totally consumed with being the caterpillar. But inexorably and unavoidably, it builds a cocoon and transforms itself into a butterfly. I think that this is important, not only because it is materially true in nature, that is, an example of such transformative change is not unavailable to us, and that it serves as literal representation and as metaphorical key to understanding a transformation that we ourselves, as individuals, as a family, as a species, are capable of, but have been radically neglecting and or ignoring due to our own self-imposed social conditioning. That social conditioning has led us to quite a miserable way of life. But despite the fact that our family of humanity has been self-enslaved by ourselves, playing the roles of perpetual war profiteers, and that enslavement has gone on for centuries now, true, genuine peace, that which the system encourages us to think of as impossible to achieve, is indeed possible. It just resides on the other side of that transformation, the fullest sense, the biggest sense of peace. We might be able to achieve um, temporary bubbles of peace here and there. I think those examples serve to remind us that true, genuine, worldwide peace is achievable. Given the nature of the universe, nothing is really truly finite and ever completely achieved. All things are forever, you know, layering on top of layers. And thus, we must evolve our thinking about everything. And the evolution could, should, might, I invite you to consider, uh, include the following. A deep, genuine self-liberation an abdication from and of all ideological constructs. That means identity boxes, labels, uh, mental themes that dictate our thinking and behavior, the dark side of which is indeed brainwashing and mind control, of which we've subjected ourselves to ourselves for generations now. This self-liberation is achievable many ways, but one of the more effective ways is through meditation. But every path is their own. Everyone is on a separate path. They all converge, though. And I propose to you that we must rally to unite all the different methodologies that can lead towards self-liberation of the consciousness from mind, Right? Mind is the collection of ideological constructs that build up, builds up identity, and we wear it like a mask. But consciousness is true source, that which we truly are, that which is meant by I am in the cosmic or spiritual or esoteric sense. Pick your favorite word. I know some words are less favored than others. Words, 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 if we get caught up in them and create conflict, they have become a waste of time. Um, Meditation is, of course, the abdication of everything, and that's a radical, revolutionary statement, not some cliché. I mean truly, genuinely, the abdication of self. In order for uh, true healing and true unification to achieve and to blossom organically, this process is, of course, intensely individual, but simultaneously, because of a whimsical factor of a certain aspect of the universe that we are not currently accessing regularly because we've kept these blinders mostly shut. Um, most of us fail to recognize that 
Although we seem separate here in the material level, each of our dimensions have many levels within it, and one of the energetic levels within this material dimension, and there are other dimensions that have more materiality, and there are dimensions that have less materiality, but each dimension has multiple layers within, because everything is layers within layers within layers. Fractal nature uh, operates in that way. Um, but here in this layer of layers, we neglect the simple fact that on the energy layer, we are all networked together. And thus, meditation is not only an individual process or an individual practice, it is also a community one. It is something that we engage in, whether we do it in a tiny room by ourselves or you know, in a grassy field with 15 other people. Regardless, when we meditate, we all contribute to the phenomena that occurs at the energy level. This is critical towards a successful healing of the species and thus a graduation or advancement up through the, into the next lesson or the, the, next, um, the next great event in human evolution. In order uh, for us to achieve that, we must build the momentum in the most mundane level of our existence towards a triggering a global tipping point enlightenment event. It's sort of like the pre-qualifier event. We're in kindergarten. We want to get into first grade. But before that, we need to get our act together in kindergarten. And that is creating this a uh, wave of engagement or participation in meditation practice or yoga practice or any of the many tools that bring us deep within and allow us to or facilitate us in the inner revolution of liberating ourselves from ideological constructs and things that control our perception, our actions, our beliefs, etc., this tipping point enlightenment event is the solution to all the mundane and horrible and traumatic problems that we face in our everyday normal quote unquote life. I quote unquote normal because there's no such thing, even within the boundaries of this most simple way of describing reality, there's no such thing as normal, right? So I'm not trying to label anything or judge in any direction. I'm just calling the material world and the most mundane interpretation of it normal. Uh, because to everyone else, it sounds a little unnormal to be talking about networks in the ether. Um, but there is such a thing. Each species has it. And I describe some of its function in other episodes. But here's the sort of culmination of the thesis. If we as individuals learn how to begin the process of truly rediscovering ourselves, we will then learn things like how to heal ourselves. And we do not need to learn them from some guru. Although there are many practices that have been established that do work. Ultimately, we're about to learn a whole new way of being. The way the caterpillar no longer does caterpillar things once it becomes a butterfly. This transformation is hard to describe because arguably our species has never been through it before. Or any other transformative events that we have been through, for example, advancing from just an animal state into a, a ever approaching to, you know, existing personhood state. The transformation was so radical that we have no record of what it was like before. There's no way to translate into the new modality that which was normal or everyday or average or what we sort of always did in the past state of operations. But as we approach it, we will heal ourselves in this, in this modality. These avatars will heal. And when we heal ourselves, and here's one of the major things that I think is quite important to uh, the whole, it's a linchpin to the whole thesis when we heal ourselves, we heal each other. When we heal each other, we heal everyone, ultimately. That means if we heal ourselves as a group, then we arguably heal our enemies. This is the antithesis or the, uh, the response to the much more common 
idea that we got to kill all the bad guys in order to retake or reclaim our freedoms. No, we got to go deep within to liberate ourselves at that level from the starting place within in order for the freedom to manifest out from within us and thus radically change the society that we perceive. Does that sound crazy to you or does that sound reasonable? There's only one way to find out, and that's a rigorous personal application in a scientific method, like as a citizen scientist, not a corrupt corporate scientist, but as citizen scientists, as natural scientists, as true, genuine, organic human beings, we must investigate rigorously at a personal and group dynamic level meditation and and any and all of the legitimate tools that help facilitate our, quote, awakening our, whatever you want to call it, our, our spiritual advancing. From my personal investigation, meditation is sort of highly effective because it gets right at the most, mm, the most quick silver and radically challenging of the things we must heal ourselves through and that's our own ego construct trying to fuck our own lives up more about that in future episodes as always I hope that this facilitated and entertained this is who I am and I label myself a fictional character because in a way I'm I'm trying to create art this is just one layer to it right there's going to be other layers to it And I'm just sort of laying down the groundwork and the fundamentals so that future collaborators who are like, well, what's this whole world you're trying to create about? Check out. Here's the thing. Here's the record of my statements. And I don't got to repeat myself too much. But also, I'm trying to reach real, genuine people like you, dear listener, out there. Not to force you to believe in me or in my ideas, but to challenge you to go deep within and investigate it for yourself. If you've got questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you've got... uh, more sophisticated and more advanced ideas because you're an even more experienced and more well-researched meditator, let's collaborate. As always, I'm sending you peace, love, and grooviness. May you feel them blossoming in your heart and may you share them with the people around you because that's what the world needs most right now. Until next time, I am your humble host, the weird, the wacky, the radically spiritual cannabinoid mystic, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo. Find me anywhere on social media, hashtag Mr. Zeppo. If I'm not on your favorite platform, tell me about it. I'll try to sign up. If you want to help run online representation, like a Facebook group or a there's mines and there's all these new platforms cropping up and I frankly am just one person. If you want to be one of those um, uh, fan volunteers and help me run a place to uh, uh, represent, hit me up on my Gmail, the incorrigible Mr. Zeppo at gmail.com. Peace. <laughs>